so, so let me just start with this uh, session from a distributed monolith to a microservices solution. Um, I, I'd like to tell you my experience from going from a monolith to, uh, to a microservices solution, or at least something which looks like it. Uh, I'm Jan de Vries, cloud solution architect at a small consulting firm based in the Netherlands uh, called Fortinet, uh, at which I'm doing well a lot of consulting and mostly migrating on-premises solution to the cloud or expanding the current cloud ecosystem they have focused on uh, Azure solutions. So uh, this talk is also uh, focused on, on well, Azure, or at least most of the services I, I'm talking about is Azure related. But first, uh, well, going from a monolith to a microservices solution, why? That's, that's actually the question I'm asking most of my clients nowadays, uh, because a monolith solution most of the time is a pretty robust solution. It has stood the ages of, well, it has stood the, 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 the time uh, for quite some time. Most of them are quite old, or at least quite old. They're older as two years. Uh, so uh, uh, they, they work, they make money. So why move away from something which makes money to something, well, something else? Uh, sure, there are reasons. Uh, most of my clients say, or at least the developers say, yeah, we want to scale globally. We want to scale this part, this part, and uh, microservices are better. It's 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 the cloud, it's the future, and that's just not true, or at least not per se. A monolith is a perfectly fine architecture. Uh, if you've designed this well and that's most that's the problem most of the time because most of the time the monolith which they want to move off from isn't designed very well but what happens if they're not careful they're creating some kind of services architecture with a lot of well services doing their own little thing because they think that's what microservices is all about and when you do something to one service everything will fall down or at least that's that's what i'm seeing quite a lot at uh, customers um, so instead of making this big distributed jenga tower why not start with the monolith first or why not start at your problem first because yeah, like I mentioned, if you move one block from the tower, everything crumbles. And this is this goes for the for the monolith solution they have uh, most of the time because it's not designed properly. So there's a lot of technical debt. And if you change one class, you probably have to change lots of other classes also. So a lot of customers also say, yeah, we want to start from scratch and do everything in a greenfield solution which is good, good and fun for me as an external consultant, but most of the time not very cost efficient. So I'd advise against such a scenario. Um, but let me also state, state first before I'm going uh, into the techniques and, and the, the pitfalls uh, with such a migration, there is no silver bullet with such a migration. That's just the truth. No customer is the same. Sure, there are some principles you can uh, you can adopt uh, to to make your overall solution and migration better, but there is no silver bullet. No, if if you read the blog post, this is how, this is a step by step plan how to move away from your monolith to a Microsoft solution. It's probably their experience, not something you can map one on one on your uh, your customer, your project. So be aware of this. So everything I'm telling you now is my experience. And also some of the pitfalls and practices I've learned from doing well, quite a couple of migrations of, of these types of projects. 
And well, the first one, like I mentioned, is asking why move away. So that's the first question. Um, so we also thought we had to go from our monolith solution to, to a Microsoft solution. And at one of my customers, what we did is, uh, well, what we started out with was something which looks like this. We had, well, like, like everyone, we had some, uh, or like most people, uh, we had some uh, SQL server with some database uh, holding all our customer data and some backend systems like uh, SAP, SharePoint, uh, Salesforce, uh, you name it, we had them, uh, which also held some customer data. And that's, this was a lot of data and we had, we had some internal, uh, internal uh, services using, uh, using it so our employees could use all of this. And obviously an identity service to log in, log out, uh, holding credentials, stuff like this. Also stored in the customer database. Uh, so this is uh, all good and well. We're quite happy with this our starting point for well, having lots of data of customers. And because we had a lot of data of customers, uh, which was quite valuable, well, valuable data, if, you, if you're in the market of, of this, this type of data, so uh, we uh, got approached by some uh, well partners now and uh, they said yeah we'd like to integrate we'd like to have all this data or at least use it or uh, extend it or extend our own services with it or uh, add uh, data to your uh, data sources um, so that's that's good making our well monetizing the data monetizing the well user data uh, so what we did is uh, we created an integration uh, service. So this integration service was, well, the entry point to our data repositories like the SQL Server, Salesforce, SharePoint, all of them. It connected to all of those services, aggregated the data, modeled it to some kind of a useful format, and exposed it to our business-to-business -business API. And this business-to-business -business API is the API our partners could connect to to fetch the data. It was a rather thin layer uh, because, well, all of the aggregation stuff was being handled in the integration service. So still pretty happy with this uh, design uh, because our B2B API could be held uh, quite small and thin and scale, well, easily because it was so thin. Um, after a couple of months, we discovered some partners were so happy with it. They were hammering the API uh, with thousands of requests per uh, minute. So we had to add an API management, uh, Azure API management in front of it, uh, which is a good idea anyway. Having some B2B management uh, service uh, API uh, in front of it to, to manage API management. You can do it in a portal and the management uh, uh, site also, but that's not something our um, well stakeholders liked using or account managers. So we created a nice management uh, suite for them. And we stored the data in a separate SQL database because we figured, yeah, all this partner management data isn't exactly stuff we want to integrate with our customer data. So a new database was spun up and that went well, went quite well for, well, I think a year or so. And then we thought, this is working so well, why not use this service ourselves also? Because you've probably heard about the term dog food in your own product or drinking your own champagne. So we thought, let's do this also, because if we're using our own API, we can probably find bugs, issues, performance uh, uh, optimizations, or missing features our partners are also experiencing. So that sounds like a good idea, and it is. Um, and at the time, we had a financial institution, a bank, contacting us, uh, or well, we contacted the bank if we wanted to uh, get some uh, the payment information of our customers and well store it in our own ecosystem uh, so there's whole procedures to to do this and uh, to get approval for this 
so we got it. And as you might know, I don't know how it, how it is in Australia, but uh, here in Europe, banks and financial institutions aren't per se the most modern and fancy institutions concerning techniques. So what we had to do is connect with an FTP server, connect to an FTP server, download uh, files from a specific folder, par well unzip these files, parse them to some kind of a usable format because they were zipped, encrypted, and uh, uh, zipped and encrypted. Well, encrypted two times because reasons, I guess. So that uh, we had to parse and afterwards model it to something useful for our own ecosystem and push it to the B2B API. So all, all, all well. So we th we were thinking, well, downloading, uh, parsing the stuff and processing it, like sending it away. That's three steps. And uh, someone read uh, something about uh, uh, doing microservices, and a microservice should only do one thing and do it very well. Okay. So sounds like we need three services to do so in order to. Uh, uh, to hop on the microservice bandwagon. So that's what we did. We created a web job, downloading uh, the, the files from an FTP site, uh, a parser, uh, uh, well, parser service, which was invoked by the timed web job whenever something was downloaded, and this parser did all the magic of extracting and parsing, and a processor was sending the stuff to the B2B API. And in a nutshell, uh, because we had to store some state and share the state across the services, we added a new SQL database storing the state of, well, the, the files we downloaded. And this looked very fun on paper until it didn't in practice. Because as you might see or know from experience, or, well, for me, it's pretty obvious now, uh, but what we actually had designed was a distributed monolith over here. Because what we were doing could just as well be done inside one, well, single service, uh, because it's not that fancy and we're using a single database. So whenever something is changing inside the database, like the scheme or, or uh, yeah, like the scheme, we have to check all three services if they're still well uh, compliant with uh, with the new scheme, and if not, change all of those services. So that's that's one of the well, one of the things to look out for when going microservices. Are they sharing the same database? No, you're probably doing a, you're probably doing a distributed monolith. So that's one thing uh, uh, we found when this was in production. One other thing is uh, the way we designed it, uh, each service called uh, called the next service. So whenever the processor service was failing for reasons, uh, the parser and the timer web job also threw exceptions, meaning nothing got processed, nothing went inside our data repository and all the files, well, were, were still standing at, at the bank's FTP location, which was, well, kind of annoying. Uh, no one got, got hurt and no service got hurt and the files weren't lost in the process, but still annoying when, when something like this happened. So that's also one of the signs you're doing something, well, not right in your design. But what? What's also a problem in this design is whenever the integration API is failing, everything is failing. And that's not something, uh, the integration API was quite stable, almost never fell down, but when it did, our whole ecosystem went down because we had designed a lot of synchronous calls and services calling services. So that's bad. So we didn't only create a small distributed monolith, we created a rather big distributed monolith. 
which is nah, not very fun to maintain, especially if you're making breaking changes some of the times. So what we should have been doing instead of making a lot of cool well services and uh, using the newest and fanciest uh, techniques in Azure, we should have been thinking about what are we supposed to solve? Which problem are we supposed to be solved? Uh, which problem are we solving? And well, how, well, what should we have been doing? Maybe, just maybe we should have get to know the business people a bit better because most of the time the business people actually know what they want uh, and, and well, maybe not how, but they know they have a problem which needs to be solved. So if you listen and talk to the business people, you might ac actually learn what you're, well, what you should be creating and how to solve this problem. Uh, one of the key features, one of the, well, the, the key uh, benefits of talking to them is you get to know their jargon. When they're talking about a customer, you know, or you get to know what a customer actually means. Because if you're talking to an account manager, a customer is a totally different person when compared to when you're talking to a service test person or maybe a, a marketeer. That's to, uh, those customers are three, three totally different, well, objects. Uh, because uh, the goal of each of those stakeholders is different. An account manager doesn't need to know, well, doesn't need to know per se, how many tickets, how many uh, uh, alerts uh, the customer has been, has been raising. Sure, it might be good to know the, the sentiment of, of the customer when he or she is calling, uh, calling him, but uh, it's not one of the, the key metrics the account manager is, uh, is working with. So get to know the jargon and write down the functionality they want. I personally like uh, writing it down on a sticky, a small sticky with a marker, so a big pen. So you can only write down one or two words when talking to the stakeholders. Why? Well, that means you have to actually listen to what they're telling because you can't write down a whole es essay on the sticky note. You can only write down one or two words, maybe an arrow or uh, some something else, and that's it. So you have to pay attention to what they're saying, make a reminder for yourself, put it on the on the wall, and when you're well busy at your office at your desk, you can check out the the sticky and be reminded of how the conversation went, what was being said, stuff like this. So that's well. To, to a lot of uh, developers I'm working with, that's a whole new uh, way of working, talking to people and talking to the business people. Because talking to our own teams is, well, uh, something most of us are doing anyway. But talking to the business is, well, a whole new level. And it takes some getting used to. But once you know what the business people, what the, what the stakeholders want, you can translate this into some kind of a functional, well, functional domain, functional wishes, uh, and, and translate this to, well, how to solve this in the technical space. So uh, at a different project, uh, a traveling agency, we also uh, had to move to the cloud and make it scalable and dominate the world. Um, so what we did over there, uh, we started quite all right, in my opinion. Uh, we were talking with the business people, the stakeholders, the product owners, and get to know what they actually wanted. And after having talked to, well, lots, lots and lots of people, so this takes quite a lot of time, we came up with, uh, well, something which looks like this. So as a traveling agency, you have this, uh, this thing called, uh, you want to book well, vacations. Uh, you have a catalog where which holds the vacations, and most of the time people want to search for vacations. Uh, well, for wherever they uh, want to go, 
Uh, do you want to go to a sunny location? Do you want to go to the snow? Something like this. So search. So these were three uh, key functional domains we had to implement because they're important. Um, so we modeled this as three different blocks and each of those blocks stood alone, uh, didn't have any or doesn't have any connection with each other, uh, which has a major benefit for search. You can use something like uh, Azure Search, the catalog. It might be useful to store this in a Cosmos database and uh, the booking. Uh, it might be useful to store this in a relational database and maybe a redis cache in front of it to well, have, have the data available uh, uh, quickly. And this isn't new. You can also do this in a single executable uh, on-premises. Uh, this You don't have to go to the cloud to model something like this. But my experience is when you're modeling this in one big executable, most of the time we find a way to only connect to one single database and do some projections on it, creating views, uh, creating whatever type of database uh, you have, and find a way to get the data, store the data in one database and retrieve it and making very slow queries. In the cloud, it's easier to spin up a search database, NoSQL database, caches, stuff like this, because it's just one click away. So this is a, a bit how, how we modeled it. And sure, you might say, yeah, when booking a vacation, I still need to know the title, the description, the location, etc. stuff data from the catalog. And that's true. And also when searching for vacations, you also need data from the catalog. Uh, so I need to connect to this database. And that's not something I want or at least not something I would uh, advise to do. Um, I've drawn this, this nice uh, little event service uh, underneath, uh, the event grid icon uh, over there. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, whenever something major happens inside one of these blocks, I'm sending an event to the event service and any one of the other blocks can pick up this event and do something with it. So whenever there's a new vacation being uh, stored in the catalog or updated. An event is being sent out and the search and the booking can well update or subscribe uh, to those events and do something with it. So this means I can keep my, my well functional domains have a single responsibility and keeping them rather simple. I don't, when creating the booking domain, I don't have to think about the catalog, the, the search, the payment, the email reminders, the whatever. That's all something else. I only have to focus on the booking and creating a booking, updating a booking, stuff like this. So that's the only responsibility of this block, booking. Makes the, makes the overall service rather simple. Now you might be thinking, oh wow, to store, to do all of this stuff inside one service, it, it will create a pretty, pretty big service. Could be true. Uh, that could be an implementation, but you could also implement this functional block like so. Having a small API, an app service, communicating with a storage queue and a function picking up uh, com uh, commands, messages from the from storage queue, updating the repositories, updating caches, uh, whatever. Uh, so this is an implementation detail. So the overall design is those blocks and they have to do something with it. And this is just an implementation detail of one of those blocks. When talking, ab when talking to the stakeholders, the product owners, they don't care how many Azure functions uh, I have in my solution. They don't care if I'm using a storage queue or service bus queue. They don't care if I'm using queue. They just want their functional, well, problem. And they want their problems being solved. And they're asking me or my team to do so. And this is just an implementation detail, just like 
creating an if statement or a switch statement is an implementation detail. On, on the higher level, you don't actually care. You just want the code to flow appropriately. And then there's the next, uh, the next principle. Do repeat yourself, the dry principle. And I see your thinking. I don't actually see, see your thinking, but you could be thinking. I thought it was don't repeat yourself, the, the dry principle. And that's true until, well, 25 minutes ago. Now it's do repeat yourself. Because I've done lots of projects where I thought, yeah, let's do this dry. Let's create an abstraction of this class. And oh, we need another base class. And oh, we need to do some composition over here in order to not repeat this uh, uh, this calculation, not repeat this business logic, not repeat whatever. And it works quite well. All of my solutions didn't have a single line of, well, uh, uh, duplicated code because everything was abstracted away, composed away. It was very, very clean, you might say. But no one could understand how the code flowed anymore because I had so many abstractions in the code. Uh, so much logic was, uh, was, yeah, it's fun redefining dry. Uh, 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 so much abstractions going on. No one understood, even me, what, hap what was happening. Uh, so that's not actually the goal of writing clean code or not repeating yourself. Um, so when going microservices or when uh, creating distributed uh, services, it's actually fine to duplicate some code. It, you don't have to go above and beyond to avoid duplicating code. It's fine to have some duplicated code. Sure, if you're doing tax calculations, it might be useful to create a NuGet package for this and use this NuGet package to uh, calculate tax in all of your services because that, well, kind of has rules uh, bound to it and it should be the same everywhere. Um, but sure, there are exceptions, uh, but keep, keep on thinking. Think what you're doing uh, because I, I want a quote from uh, Sandy Metz. Uh, I saw this quote on, on uh, someone else's slides. I don't know if it was Sandy's, but uh, uh, she, she uh, has a quote, duplication is far cheaper than wrong, wrong abstraction. And I was, do you, would disagree with this like 10, 15 years ago, but after having seen a lot of abstract, abstracted code and a lot of complexity it brings, I think, yeah, this she could be onto th something. Duplicating the code 20 times across 20 services and fixing the same bugs bug 20 times, oftentimes is cheaper as abstracting it away and adding complexity or NuGet packages or whatever. So uh, something to think about, but still think about it. Don't take my word for it or don't take some some other clean code uh, uh, guru uh, word for it. Uh, think about what you're doing. That's what we're also being paid for. Next up is loosely coupling. Also one of those software principles uh, we're fond of, uh, but it also applies on your solution design because, well, software and solutions are pretty uh, pretty much the same, just on a different level. So how to achieve loosely coupled code uh, in your overall design? Well, messaging services is, uh, is one way uh, to, to get this. So creating small services and sending messages or events to those messaging services. In Azure, you can use uh, storage queues, service bus queues, service bus topics, and uh, event grid topics. And you can use all of them. You can use one of them, you can use two of them, whatever you want. Uh, most of the time, 
I'm using uh, storage queues and event grid topics nowadays. Event grid topics, custom topics, uh, because event grid is just awesome. Uh, and it's, well, in my opinion, the best eventing mechanism you can use in Azure, uh, or at least for, for, business, uh, for business events. <laughs> and storage queues, because they're just cheap, they cost next to about nothing, and they work pretty well for sending uh, messages across services. If you need some fancier uh, stuff, uh, 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 service bus is the way to go. Um, at the current project I'm on, we're using uh, all of, well, we're using storage queues, service bus queues, and event grid topics. Storage queues and event grid topics, well, for the reasons I mentioned uh, earlier. Service bus queues, because we had to put a message on a queue and it should be visible in 14 days from now. Um, you can solve this by storing a record in a database, having a timer function, and uh, pinging the database, is there something to process? But that's just old school. Uh, for service bus queues, you can say, uh, well, uh, delay this uh, message till uh, 14 days from now, and it will get picked up for you. So you don't have to do anything fancy, you just have some time out on your message. So that's one reason to use service bus. It, it comes with a price point, but it's still fairly cheap, in my opinion. So I also mentioned events and messages. Yeah. Uh, service bus queue only allows one consumer topic slow. Yes, yes. So a question from William. Um, I'll go back to, to this uh, slide. Uh, his question is, service bus queues only allow one consumer, uh, topics allow multiple? Yes, that's true. Uh, for a service bus queue, it's a queue, it has one subscriber. If you need multiple subscribers for a, for a message, you can use topics, which is something I'd like to see it as a queue with uh, virtual queues. So you can create a subscription and subscribe to specific uh, messages and you can have like, well, a lot, a lot of uh, subscriptions, uh, 2,000 or 20,000, I, I don't remember, uh, subscriptions per, uh, per topic. So that's quite a lot. I saw Albert in the session, maybe he knows on the top of his head, he's if I'm not mistaken, he's one of the one of the service bus gurus. Um, but uh, already talked about about events and messages. Um, events, well, they're pretty much well. They look the same. Um, you can you can use events and put them on queues uh, and and message. You can send messages to event grid. Uh, it's not something I'd advise uh, to do so, but I get asked sometimes, what's the difference between them? Well, there is some, there is quite a big difference because they're used for different things. Uh, so what's an event? I found a nice definition on the Microsoft documentation site. An event, well, is something some, someone, some service is sending and it's just sending it out to the world and it has no expectation on what's going to happen with it. So if you press a key on your keyboard, your keyboard or your, your, your keyboard driver will send an event to your operating system, but it doesn't actually know what will happen. Well, if you have a word open, the, the, the letter will, uh, will probably be placed inside your page. If you're doing something else, the operating system uh, might open your Windows Explorer or Finder. Uh, but it's an event, it's being sent, and something will pick it up or not. You don't care. The publisher doesn't care. It's the consumer who cares. And a message, well, a message is fundamentally different. When you send a message, uh, I'd like to call them commands uh, because I'm using them as commands. When I'm sending a command, I have an expectation of something is going to happen. So when I'm creating a booking, I'll send, let's say, a create a booking command, and I have the expectation the booking will be created. So maybe I'm expecting 
a booking has been created event or something like this. Uh, so that's fundamentally different uh, between the two. So, uh, one of the designs I adopt quite often nowadays when I'm doing projects in Azure is I have a very thin API layer. It does some validation, some modeling of, of data and then sends a command to the storage queue and uh, Azure Function will pick pick up this command, do his magic uh, with it, and uh, well, and be done with it. Send send events to uh, to well, send events. And in Azure, you have this Signal R service. So whenever a booking is created, in this example, uh, I'm sending a booking created event via Signal R to to the customer to the customer website. So uh, he or she will get notified, uh, your booking has been created, yay, you'll get to go on vacation. But now I'm sending it to, uh, to the customer. I can also send the same or something, a similar event to event grid, uh, because other services might also be interested in, in this event. So that's why I'm sending it over there also. Same goes for when a booking is updated. Someone might want to know, like a payment, uh, payment block. Most uh, traveling agencies like to get paid also. So maybe uh, that one wants to know whenever a booking is being made or updated. So what's the content of a message? Well, all of it. Everything you can think about should go in a message, in a command. Everything which is necessary to complete the action you want to be, you want to have completed. So in the case of a booking, create a booking, uh, you want to send all of it, all of the information of the customer, of the, of the vacation, of the whatever. You want to send it in a command and it can get processed by the function, like in the earlier example. You know it only has one receiver, in case of a queue in a topic, it can have multiple receivers, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, you you know because uh, you know where it will uh, where it will end up because it lives inside your own domain. Probably in the same uh, solution of Visual Studio or whatever ID you're using. Uh, so whenever you change your command, your message, you probably get red squigglies whenever something is not compiling. So it's easy to change. And because it's easy to change, it can be quite well bloated. It's quite different from an event because an event can have an infinite amount of receivers. You don't know because you don't have any expectation of what happens with an event. When I'm sending a booking has been created event to event grid, if I'm in the booking context, I haven't got a clue who is interested in this event. I'm just sending it out to the world and whoever is interested can pick it up. Which means if I'm changing this event, I might mess up other services. So you have to be very, very careful changing something in it. It lives outside your domain. So what are good practices I've adopted uh, in, the, in the past, well, couple of years? Um, whenever sending an event, just send an ident identifier. Uh, book and create it, ID, and the GUID. Uh, that should be enough for booking updated, the ID. Um, why is this a good practice? Well, if you're event is uh, self-describing the uh, or self yeah describing your subscribers already know what has happened and if it is interested in in this type of event and does it know what has happened no it doesn't in order to get to know what the latest state is of well let's say a booking it has to query the booking service so most of the time you create some API like get booking uh, a booking get and uh, with an identifier and you get the latest state. So in this case, take for example, a payment service makes a get request to the booking 
and gets well all of the data it needs from from uh, the booking service. You can get fancy with this by using GraphQL, uh, for example, like we saw in the previous uh, session. Uh, so only getting the projection you actually want. Uh, but that's about it. And that's the only connection we have. So whenever the booking service isn't available, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but we still have we still have the latest state in our payment service because we've stored it already, uh, the state, and we might work with old data. But if that's the case, we can just retry it, retry it, retry it. Uh, that's why it's a good idea to isolate the data you need in your own system. So the payment service probably has a copy of the well necessary data in its own repository for a specific booking. So in the payment uh, context, you probably want to know what the price was of this booking, uh, how much has been paid already, uh, the identifier, obviously, uh, maybe some other data. Some other practice uh, we've, we've done in the past is sending the current and the previous state in an event. And when doing so, the event gets a bit more bloated, but also a bit more useful. Uh, because we uh, also had implemented a payment, uh, payment context for the traveling agency uh, because, well, they also want to get paid. Um, and when sending a, an, uh, an event like a payment has been made for booking, um, we don't actually know what has happened, how much has been paid. Is the payment complete? Well, the payment complete should be a different event, but how much has been paid? From the thousand euros, uh, the, the customers paid 200, so he still needs to pay 800 euros. Uh, so that's why we adopted in this case, this specific case, to send the previous and current state. So the previous state was uh, 1,000 euros was the outstanding uh, amount. The current state is 800 uh, euros is standing out and the customer still has to pay this. So we can send a reminder, 800 euros still has to be paid. Useful, but think about what you're uh, uh, storing in your event, because whenever you change this, stuff will break. And that could be a problem. So a practice we adopted uh, for Azure, and it might be a good idea to do this in our clouds also. I'm not sure how those work. But you can, uh, you can have Azure Functions subscribe to event grid topics, which is awesome. They scale insanely, both scale insanely. Um, the downside is if your function is down for some reason, um, Event Grid uh, will still try to send it to your function and it has some exponential back off mechanism, back, back off mechanism, which is cool. However, when this back off mechanism fails after five times, by default, if I'm not mistaken, it will uh, throw the messages in some uh, dead letter uh, uh, location if you configure this because it's off by default or at least you have to add some uh, json in your arm template to do so um, and this is fine it's just hard to get those if or at least i find it hard to get those events from the dead letter location back to your function to resend them uh, as you might say. So what we did is place a storage queue in between because storage queues are always up because it's on storage and if storage goes down, all of Azure goes down because everything needs storage. So it's a pretty safe bet to say storage queues are always up. Unlike your Azure function, which could be down for a number of reasons. Uh, and event grid is most of the time also always up. So these two are pretty safe bets. So what we're doing now is sending all events which are, well, uh, which we're subscribed to, sending them to a queue and picking them up. Uh, it doesn't matter much for, for the, the for scaling and for, for, the, uh, for the extra hop. Uh, sure, there's an extra hop, so it will take a bit more time, but 
it's not noticeable. It's a background, background process anyway. So that's a good practice we adopted and I'm adopting everywhere, almost everywhere now, uh, just for the stability. And well, from a functional perspective, you don't, you don't see, uh, you don't notice it anything anyway. Would you recommend the outbox pattern for extra safety in case of, yes, in case of something goes down? Yes, yes, the outbox pattern is definitely something you should be adopting when, uh, when doing so. Um, we have major problems at, at uh, one of the projects uh, uh, I'm at now uh, because we're sending an email to a customer and we have to add the state to the data to some other service, an email has been sent. So we're working at a very, very disputed monolith solution right now. Um, and when, when you're in such pain, you really need the outbox pattern. The outbox pattern is um, uh, you're holding the state of an action if it uh, in, in some kind of repository and holding the state if it has been processed or not. And if not, you will just retry uh, a specific action until it, the complete transaction has been completed. That's in a nutshell. I'm sure Wikipedia has a better definition uh, of it. But yes, use it if you're in a distributed monolith or, or maybe even an event-driven distributed monolith. Because that's what happens when you add events to a distributed monolith. You have an event-driven distributed monolith and there's nothing worse compared to that, to my knowledge. If you know something which is worse, please let me know in chat because I I want to read more about it, but uh, let me start with the first first bullet point: bloat defense, uh, lots of data. Like I mentioned, you have the ripple effect when you add lots of data in your events. You're in major pain. Not not now, not a week from now, but two months from now, you're in major pain because then your product owner or your business has decided we need additional fields and old fields can be removed. Dependencies between systems. Now, like I mentioned uh, uh, with my example uh, uh, of the outbox pattern, we need to send an email and some other service needs to store state. An email has been sent and we need to query, uh, well, this, this other service, the email has been sent. Uh, and if one of them fails, or at least if the second fails, we'll send another email. So we have dependencies between systems and an inconsistent state. Uh, so, well, customers will get emails twice, three times, four times, the number of times it's being retried. Uh, luckily, we're not in production yet. And there's on top of our task board, there's a, a job adding the outbox pattern for this in order to solve it for now, because our design is just wrong. So like I mentioned, the event-driven distributed monolith is a major pain because in a distributed monolith, you can most of the time follow the path, how a command, how a message is flowing through your system. When you add events in the mix, you can't. Stuff just happens magically. Uh, events are being sent down to event grid or whatever eventing mechanism you have. Commands are being sent all over the place. And if you don't have some kind of correlation identifier in your messages, uh, it's impossible to tell how and why something has happened. And you always figure this out during a production incident. So uh, keep away from such, such designs. But when you do design uh, this stuff properly, you have this next principle, the, the open close principle, and this also goes for your solution design, because uh, in the block booking, only the booking block, the booking domain is responsible for the bookings, the state of the bookings. No other service can modify the state, the data of this booking. Um, so it's closed for modification, this data. Same goes for payment. No one can modify the payment information aside from the payment, uh, payment domain. It is open for extension. Uh, if I decide I want to add 
well, let's uh, what do we have more in traveling agency? I don't have an example now, but by listening to the events which are being sent, I can extend the functionality of my ecosystem of my solution because events are being sent for key domain events, uh, which which need to be shared. Uh, so I can add new functionality on top of the rest. I can even remove services and spin up new services doing, well, new, uh, doing the same thing, but uh, version two. So uh, uh, adding new versions side by side, that's, that's very, very powerful, extending uh, stuff like this. But how to get there? I have to hurry a bit. Uh, I'm almost done anyway. How to get there? Well, um, baby steps, baby steps. You won't get there in the next months. Uh, I, I read a post of uh, Kent Beck uh, just uh, this week, and he posted something similar. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing over here. Uh, he, he wrote something like, it probably took you ages or years and years and years of development to get to this ugly monolith solution you have now. Don't expect you will have a very nice and shiny microservices solution a month from now. It will probably take the same amount of time. Uh, so how to get there? Well, uh, it will take a lot of time and it's the DevOps cycle. You need to plan, code, build, deploy, etc., and reflect on yourself. Um, and improve in baby steps, boy scouting, the, the tightly coupled uh, 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 dependencies between your functional domains. And when you think, well, I can extract this piece of code, this piece of functionality from my service, um, try it, try to decouple it, uh, try to put it in some other module, maybe a service, if you're feeling really lucky and run this side by side. So toggle it via feature toggle, perhaps. So the old, uh, so the old path and the, and the new loosely coupled path and run them, uh, try to run them uh, side by side or uh, toggle them and well, do this iteratively. And maybe in about two, three, four years, you will have a nicely loosely coupled design. And maybe, maybe, you can just stay with your monolith solution with a nice modular design. Uh, and if you need to, you can just extract uh, modules and put them inside a microservice. Um, if, if you actually need to have need to implement this, but it will take a lot, a lot of time. It's a lot of work, but someone has to do this. And uh, well, who better to do this as us because I guess we all like to do uh, this. I like to refactor the stuff, make the code better. Uh, it's something I like doing anyway, uh, especially in cloud environments like Azure, because there's always some new fancy solution you can use to make this easier uh, for you, for your development team. Uh, but it takes a lot of time and you have to be up for it. So uh, that's, that's it for now for me. Um, yeah, no questions yet. So uh, I have a couple of minutes left, if I'm not mistaken. So if you have any questions uh, now in the chat, it's okay. You can also ask them in the room one of Slack uh, or feel free to reach out to me uh, later on. 